Welcome everyone to the PAX East Fear Factor panel. Um, I'm Ali Foreman, an entertainment reporter with Mashable, obsessed with video games and obsessed with horror. Uh, today I'm joined by three excellent panelists. Would you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves one at a time? Why don't we start with you, Barney? Uh, thanks, I'm uh, Barney Pratt. I'm audio director of Supermassive Games. Uh, currently focused on the Dark Pictures Anthology. Uh, the last game in that series, or the next game in that series to come out, will be out on the 30th of October. It's called Little Hope and uh, just in time for Halloween. Uh, my name is Lucas. Uh, I'm the lead producer of uh, Little Nightmares. So I've been uh, working on uh, this franchise uh, since we, uh, we, we started uh, at Bandai Namco, our relationship with Starship Studio. Uh, and I, I'm very happy to, uh, to be there. Okay, I'm, I'm Michel Ziegler. I'm developer at Hidden Fields in Lucerne, and uh, I'm making Mundown, which is a folklore-inspired horror tale. So let's just dive straight into what this panel is all about. What makes games scary? Barney, can you start us off? So I'm biased. Being an audio director, I'm going to jump straight in and say it's the audio, of course. Uh, but I know that's not entirely true. Um, I could bang on about that for hours. Um, it's, a, it's a number of things. It's, um, it's about uh, having a kind of emotional and sort of psychological kind of involvement with the game uh, for the players. It's, uh, it's the unexpected. It's taking um, believable characters to extreme situations. It can be suspense. It can be impact with jump scares. It's um, kind of a great number of things. It's, um, it's often the timing and the subject matter and, the, and crafting those moments to kind of take the player on a journey they weren't expecting maybe. Lucas, what do you think? No, I totally agree that sound design really plays a big, big role um, uh, in, in, in making the game very scary. I mean, the buildup and the atmosphere uh, are, are extremely important. Um, there are really different angles uh, where we can make like the, uh, the game scary. So it can be more psychological, it can be more like jump scare or more gory oriented. Uh, Little Nightmares, we tend to avoid showing too much so that you know people um, are more like thinking what's happening in the background. Uh, and we think that's, uh, that's actually more Im impactful than, than, than showing, uh, at least for our game that works, uh, that works very well. Um, and I think it's creating um, universe that are unique and, and very unsettling for the players. Uh, that, that, uh, that makes things very scary to me at least. Michelle? Yeah, I think it's very um, subjective and me personally, I like, I find it very unnerving if I enter a foreign world where, where I'm a new arrival and I don't know really how the world works, where I'm lost, a lot of unexpected sights and sounds. It's also, it's also beauty and the darkness because it, that, that can not only be dark and kind of a, a story and the characters that all work together to create this one this, this this one package so i think for me a lot of it comes down to to an, an atmosphere of dread and oppression yeah that's that's my personal preference i think in this genre when we talk about that combination of beauty and of darkness uh, horror games have traditionally been known as survival horror. You've got the Resident Evils, the Silent Hills. That's kind of where people have thought of horror games going. But all of you represent very unique, different kinds of new horror. What do you make of the way that horror games are expanding? And do you consider your projects part of a new subgenre or s multiple subgenres? Uh, would you like to start, Michelle? Yeah, I think there's definitely a lot going on and also in the indie scene when it comes to horror. And kind of Moon Down is, is kind of a bit of a, it's not a, a retro inspired game, but uh, I would like to bring some of the, the unexpectedness and the freshness of, of those games, where, um, how they felt when they came out, I think. And um, I think it's, it's more of a, the story and the, the folklore is very important uh, um, in my case. Um, yeah. I think it, just in terms of the folklore, I think it's really interesting to kind of take that and then maybe put a different twist onto it, which is where the horror comes into that kind of original story. 
I think a lot of the narratives from Supermassive have been based on uh, based on truths, based on historical fact, and kind of exploring those and kind of bringing those to kind of a, a different end to surprise the player. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of yeah different inspirations that uh, uh, that can make things very uh, very unique. Um, in 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 Little Nightmares too, we have like that character. She, it's she's a teacher, so she. Um, so basically everyone um, has experienced like having a teacher that is able to kind of, you know, hear you while she's like, you know, writing on the billboard or something. She kind of high, she kind of has like eyes behind her, um, her head or something like that. So we wanted to take that situation to the extreme where like the teacher can just twist, you know, completely her neck, her neck around. And that's, that's really scary. And that goes also with the folklore, like, the character is 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 is, uh, is inspired from um, a traditional like Japanese yokai, the Rokurakuri, which is like a um, a woman who can extend her neck. So in terms of, of gameplay and feel, she's in inspired by that. Um, so it's really it's really yeah combination of, of different things. But um, it's very important that you know the ending result feels like unique um, and authentic. That's what we're we're trying to achieve, of course. Uh, but in the case of Little Nightmares, it's uh, it's always um, complex because uh, it's about surviving. Uh, it's about yeah, we're using the the codes of the horror genre, um, but at the same time, it's difficult to say we're just a survival horror because we have platforming, we have puzzles, so we have got this multiple jar um, uh, factor, which is very interesting. Like when you talk to people, they some sometimes they just say you know you're doing platforming, sometimes they just say you're doing horror. It's just like, yeah, we're doing kind of, kind of all of that. In hearing all of you talk about your various games, I think we can all agree that it evokes a very specific, very cinematic image. And it's true across all of the games that we've discussed. In what ways do you think the increasing popularity of horror in film, because we're obviously in the middle of a, a cinematic horror renaissance, how is that uh, being mirrored in games or is it not? Is it motivated by something else? Barney, obviously the Dark Pictures anthology is hugely cinematic, um, uh, hence the whole movie night mode of Man of Medan. Um, but would you mind starting us off and giving us your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I take a lot of influences from, um, it's kind of, you can't, you can't underestimate the the influence of Netflix uh, and the indie horror scene within that. Um, it's a few great series that we've been watching recently and um, I'm always, you know, finding little tips and tricks. Um, uh, I think um, the kind of believable characters um, is, uh, has been an increasing uh, kind of, uh, of an increasing kind of crossover from cinema into games. Um, I think uh, the performances as well, that is, uh, players are uh, they're desiring uh, lifelike or hyper real performances in games to match those in, in, in film, in cinema. Um, and I think, uh, I think for, uh, for us with the, the dark pictures, uh, to, to be able to present um, a, a, an absolutely cinematic experience with, with the audio, especially, we go to you know, great lengths for the detail on those characters, the, the detail in the environment, the, the the kind of seamless flow of the game, the narrative, even within the choices and even within the multiplayer experience um, within that. So we we try and take that cinematic experience and, and really extend it into games. So I'd say we're, we're heavily uh, influenced. Um, and I think uh, there's there's such an unlimited number of subgenres that are being explored, again, within the indie uh, horror film scene. I think that's opening up uh, opportunities and styles um, within the games world as well. I mean, not to underestimate the original styles that games present as well. Yeah, definitely. There, there's. Uh, I mean, horror has never been uh, as accessible as it is now. It used to be a, a, a bit of a, of, of a niche genre, or at least you know, it, it wasn't. Uh, it was as difficult to, to 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 get like you know horror movies back in the days. Now. Like like, like uh, Barney said, it's, it's just like you know, just the expansion of Netflix. Uh, you've got original horror creations uh, from France, from Germany, uh, of course from the US, from the UK as well. Uh, that has just like opened up like uh, uh, a large audience for 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 horror genres. And um, in case of Little Nightmares, it's difficult to say like these have influenced our games directly because 
the game I think is influenced not only by horror, by a really a lot of different kind of things. If you to get like if you check the mood boards from the artist team at, at, at Tarsha, they're really amazing. It comes from everywhere. Uh, but but definitely I think it's a uh, it's a great time to make horror games. Uh, that's for sure. I mean, the, I think the audience has never been uh, as demanding as 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 as, uh, as, it, is, as it is now. Michelle, really anything to add? Yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Sorry. When when I started the game, I wasn't really thinking of a horror as a genre at all. I just had this specific vision of this folklore-inspired, very specific alpine scenario. And it's, I started in 2014. And, and, and now when I look around, there's there's folklore horror popping up everywhere, like in television, in movies. And it seems like a lot of people in parallel kind of had, had the same idea. And now it's it, it seems to be a it seems to become a massive thing, which is which is really cool. As for cinematic influence, I mean, for Moon Down, it's it's a first-person game, so I would say, and it do, it doesn't have traditional cutscenes, so the cinematic influence is not that huge. While I mean, the the, atmos um, the atmosphere, the influence of atmospheres, however, is pretty obvious. But it's it's um, largely on older horror films, like. Rosemary's, Rosemary's Babies, Rosemary's Baby, and the like, just for this archaic kind of old feeling mood that is going on. And uh, down, a lot of inspiration is actually from old photographs as well. With all of those references, death tends to serve as kind of the ultimate consequence in any horror movie, in any horror story. But obviously, death plays a really different role in terms of gameplay. Uh, how do you account for that in your own project when, uh, Lucas, you're probably the best person to start us off here since uh, Little Nightmares is a platformer. I spent uh, last night being uh, picked up by the twin chefs, which was horrifying. Um, oh. But <laughs> um, can you give us a little bit of a sense of, of how you go about creating that sense of horror? Somebody may have to die multiple times in a game. Yeah, so in Long Nightmares, we play with death in very different, um, with very different approaches. So, like, like you said, we 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 do have some some uh, die and retry kind kind of uh, of deaths where you will you will you will have to die multiple times to 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 complete the, uh, the 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 section. And and we we actually know when we intend the player to die here. We just need to, of course, avoid uh, you know creating a frustrating experience so it's it's it's, it's a lot of, of balancing uh, but at the same time we also have gameplay where um you 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 will explore uh you will explore a room and you will you will see like you know a very big monster and you know that you will have probably uh different kind of options uh to sneak around and in that case death is 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 a bit more like you know like uh the traditional uh, ultimate consequence You're, you will just avoid dying from this big monster you know that if you get spotted, you might have a, a short window to to escape, but it's gonna be it's gonna be very challenging. So uh, yeah, we, we we approach death with with different angles, and and actually that's quite fun. Um, and and we we even like sometimes yeah, uh, play like uh, little limers when we're counting the deaths of the, of the of the players and stuff like that. So it's uh, it's nice nice stats to track. Barney, obviously in dark pictures, you can lose characters altogether. How does that change the horror experience? Um, yeah, so the, the, the strap line is um, all, all, all can survive. You can kill them, everybody you can, uh, or everybody can survive. I think um, death in horror can be a good thing. So you can want something or someone dead. So I think that's kind of an interesting twist on it. That's outside of our norm. Um, we can... Uh, from an audio perspective, we can make deaths, um, you know, any level of kind of emotional uh, from kind of schmaltz all the way down to, yeah, we're happy that was over. Um, but we can, um, we can even mislead the player to make uh, some deaths seem more emotional than maybe they actually are um, for a number of reasons. So, um, no, I mean, death, deaths are, again, with Horace, it's a very subjective thing. It's, it's, not, um, it's not always as negative uh, for us in a third person with some distance maybe from some of the characters um, uh, and with multiple characters uh, in, this, in the narratives uh, to play with. So, um, so yeah, we, we can play around with that quite a lot. 
Michelle, anything to add? Um, yeah, for for move down is trying to find the right the right um, amount of punishment that a death should entail, because it's not really the main thing about the game. It's not a game that's challenge based per se and lives more from the atmosphere and story. But at the same time, you can die because the from the enemy encounters in the game. Because I personally feel I personally like if there's some element of actual threat going on in the game it's to ra to raise the stakes a little bit but again it's it shouldn't be in the foreground and also it should it, it's also an element of stor storytelling as well There's some um thing of, about one death by one creature which is pretty <laughs> it's pretty elaborate that we can't tell you yet no spoilers <laughs> We've talked a lot about horror movies, um, but in playing horror video games, it, scares are presented quite differently from movies because your players can approach things multiple times or approach them in ways you didn't expect from angles you didn't expect if you're in an environment or maybe their narrative in the Dark Pictures anthology has unfolded in a way that is not all that common, whatever it is. Um, in that way, is making a horror game more like crafting a haunted house than it is a horror movie? Uh, anyone can start. Lucas, how do you start? Yeah, I mean, uh, in our case, Little Nightmares is is very art driven. Um, so, uh, well, most of video games are more like design driven, uh, which makes it, I think, closer to movies in some ways. Um, and um, since we have like a rather linear adventure. This allows us to control the pace, to control the atmosphere, the encounters, and the build-up. Um, so, in in that respect, I think we are we're kind of closer to movies because uh, we've got a lot of people just watching playthroughs of uh, walkthroughs of, of Little Nightmares, not playing and really enjoying it. Uh, and that's uh, I think that's really great. Um, and uh, but there is still a situation where you can definitely tackle down, um, you know, your enemies from different angles. Uh, and yes, yeah, sometimes we don't expect people to do what they do and it's very fun to watch. And one thing that I really enjoy with video games is how, uh, you know, uh, how uh, it is enjoyable for people to share their experience. Uh, and when they play video game, like, you know, when, they, when they're screaming and, and, and all of that, when they're streaming their experience, that's really amazing. That's not something you've got with movies. So um, it, it's, re it's really fun to do that. Similarly, we have um, at least sections of, uh, of linear for which we can craft the experience. So we've got um, a lot of control over those scares, um, as Lucas just said. And, and um, but we, well, funnily enough, we, we've just put in a, a 360 follow cam uh, style uh, camera uh, into uh, into the into Little Hope, um, which will um, has given us some some challenges around that, about where to place the camera, etc. Uh, but since we're looking at and crafting each of the moments in the game, kind of quite heavily. Um, there's a certain amount of control we can place on that camera to improve the experience uh, for the for the player whilst giving them the expectations and freedom of that camera. Um, so that's that's been a huge advance. You know, it comes with responsibility, as you say. Yeah, we need to you know need to control that. Um, it's also about timings. Um, it's also about kind of not just getting the camera in the right position, but about crafting those moments and really uh, playing with the timings. Uh, to uh, kind of tap into uh, kind of uh, expected pause time. There's, there's something we discovered in audio very quickly. There's a, a classic way of doing a scare is you, you have a riser and then you have a sting. So you're coming into a situation, everything's getting more exciting and then whammo, you go with the sting, right? That's a classic jump scare moment. But um, if you do that the first time, uh, that's great. And the player thinks, okay, I'm definitely playing a horror game. That's, that's good. But then the next time you can do the riser and they just hold with the pause and then go with the sting. So they didn't think it was gonna come, they've given up on it and then it comes in, that can scare them. And then the third time, cause you're now playing with their expectations, you can just have a simple riser to nothing, no sting at all. So, you know, an infinite gap as it were. And um, in that way you leave them hanging cause they don't know whether that sting's gonna come still. So you're, you're just playing with their emotions. And a lot of these, uh, like the, the riser to, to nothing, that kind of on the, like, can be on the corner of exploration, can be, in any kind of situation. So there's ways of crafting those moments, even within the kind of free camera situation, uh, just to improve the experience. Michelle, how does this play into your game? 
Yeah, it's definitely more like a haunted house than a movie since it's it's very non-linear. And um, we're trying to find a, a good mix of organic and dynamic encounters and more moments that are more focused and even linear in some situations because if you don't do that there's a chance you will never have an encounter with an enemy so it's a really fine line to kind of traverse because i don't want it to feel too linear and scripted and at the same time there's no substitute for for a moment that you really design and that can be really effective uh, yeah and so that is also a lot of, there's not a lot of jump scares per se in the game but more like situations that are really scary or more of a slow, slow burning ones or even situations where you walk into a situation where you know something in front of me is some there is something's going on and but but still you need to go there because you need to you need to advance you need to find out something so the player kind of has to get over themselves and advance still, even knowing that the situation they, they walk into, they, they don't necessarily would want to. Just, can I just pick up on it? That's, that's, that was such a great discovery. When you realize you can create these situations, we have a little doubt about, is this going to be effective enough? If they go backwards, they can break in. It's like, no, no, you're forcing them to walk into their own fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, exactly. and that, that's yeah, and that's something you can only get in the interactive genre. So um, yeah, yeah that, was, that was a good discovery. Huh? Yeah. When anyone is entering the horror genre, uh, be it a filmmaker, a game developer, um, a writer, uh, they have to kind of contend with the huge catalog of horror that already exists. We've been through the post-Scream era, we did the slasher period, a lot of, and we've talked a lot about the folklore that plays into games and, and the kind of perpetuating, or excuse me, the perpetual fear uh, that people have to play into. How do you keep horror original. Michelle, I obviously don't want you to uh, give any part of your game away because we know so little and we're looking forward to it, but can you give mm -hmm. me a little sense of how you made sure your narrative was unique and original? Well, for starters, it's, it's, uh, it's, it comes from a, from a very specific place, which is like Swiss folklore. It's a very specific place that, that partially exists in the real world. So it's kind of hard to, to go generic from that, which really helps. So every architecture, every crooked barn is kind of based in reality. And the same kind of goes for the gameplay, which, which Mondan does a lot of things that you wouldn't necessarily see in a horror game when you just would think of the game, okay, let's design horror. You can, you, you do a lot of other things as well. You can, you can drive a hay loader, you will do a little day of farming, you, you do like mundane things in between, which I think really kind of helps or even puts the player into a sort of um, sense of security or sereneness, which, but, but which, is, which is always kind of overshadowed by, by the mood. And a lot of, a lot of situations in a lot of encounters, they, they kind of really evolved from just working on the game. So I, I wouldn't necessarily start from, okay, this is the premise of this encounter, but it's just walking through this world and, okay, there's, there's, a, hidden, there's a hidden room behind this wall, uh, which when you look at the mirror, you see it breaking behind you. It's, it's like this kind of stuff, which I couldn't really make up on paper planning, but that kind of emerges from making the game and I think most or some of the best moments in the game are just they weren't planned but they kind of emerged and I went with it and so I hope they surprise people like they surprised me when I, when I, <laughs> when I thought okay this is this is belongs here. Lucas can you speak to crafting original horror specifically as it pertains to making a sequel for a beloved game? How do you make Little Nightmares 2 as original as Little Nightmares 1? So, um, I mean, we're, we're uh, of course, um, keeping uh, the same strengths from uh, the first game and we're, we're trying to enrich it uh, with, with more features. So, uh, I mean, in Little Nightmares, we're, um, I think the originality comes from the perception, like you, you're really experiencing the game 
you know, from the uh, from the eyes of the of the kids. And this world is not is not a good place for kids at all. Uh, it's uh, it's dangerous. It's uh, it's disturbing. Uh, it's very unsettling. Uh, and uh, and and that's how we 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 play. And then of course we we, we introduce like you know traditional nightmares from the kids. Like when you when you go uh, under the bed and you've got like kind of very big hands trying to to look for you and and, and we try to expo- extrapolate that into into a kind of extreme situation uh, in the case of little nightmares too um we really wanted to um i mean to to go beyond the first game so we, we decided to expand with uh, with outdoor places so now you you have a forest you have a city um and uh, and and those are are a bit more open a bit less uh, linear which is uh, which is a new challenge for the team uh but it is a uh, I mean, in terms of, of technology as well, uh, it, it is a challenge, but uh, we were very happy about what we have so far. And uh, and what makes Little Nightmares unique is just the monsters. Um, like you, um, when you have your, you, you generally have like one big monster per, per chapter and there's no monster that looks like, you know, a previous one. They're really, truly original. They're all designed to make the player feel in a certain way uh sometimes they can just be like you know very aggressive like the the hunter who's just a bloodthirsty um you know taxidermist trying to uh kill everything that he sees in his forest and then just like you know they're just gonna stuff you with foam and then and that's it that's his that's his thing but uh but you know other uh other other foes they they have more complex agendas uh, obviously we haven't revealed uh, everything for little nightmares 2 yet but um the originality of each monster uh, is, is really what makes, I think, this game uh, different. Barney, how do you keep Little Hope fresh within the context of the Dark Pictures anthology? Because we already expect so much uh, following the first game. You'd say that. I mean, it's, um, uh, there's a, there is kind of kind of a format to the to the anthology where there's five playable characters, and those those characters kind of develop the narrative or develop in the narrative. Um, but there's, I mean, there's eight uh, different games uh, in progress at the moment, either either released or in progress. Um, and uh, the design for each one is just is so uh, so completely different. The the mix of um, horror genres and subgenres that come together um, to kind of in the game development and the game design um, are so different every time. Um, for example, you know, the Man of Medan was uh, kind of a, a psychological um, uh, kidnap um, uh, horror um, without too much, uh, uh, too many spoilers. Um, the uh, next one, Little Hope, um, again, without any spoilers, there's indications of a historical reference, for example, uh, indications of uh, witchcraft um, and indications of some form of creature um, and so, you know, you can only imagine uh, how, how, how this, those separate elements will piece together in this one. Um, of course, you know, I'm privy to the next couple and um, the, uh, they're in a very different um, uh, surroundings again. So uh, we kind of, uh, I guess it's super massive. We're delivering the same uh, horror experience, um, uh, but we're just changing it up every time. Um, we've innovated with the multiplayer. Um, so we're, uh, the backdrops, they're, they're just changing all the time. The subject matter's changing all the time. And we follow suit with the music. Uh, we follow suit with the soundtrack. Um, a historical reference lends itself to a historical soundtrack. Um, a uh, present day reference would lend itself to a, a present day uh, soundtrack. We were even influenced by the swelling of the sea uh, for Man of Medan. Everything was written in 3-4 uh, by our composer, Jason Graves. Um, so we, uh, for us, it's, uh, it's an amazing, uh, experience for ourselves because we can we can change up what we do on every game um, as well uh, to keep it fresh so if, you know if we're keeping it fresh then we think we're doing a, a good job for the players really. Barney this is just a question for you but I've been curious um, with having Will Poulter as a huge part of Little Hope after his role in Midsommar and his uh, role in Black Mirror Bandersnatch um, is there an element of uh, excitement or anything unusual about working with somebody who's already established as a face in the horror genre? Um, that's an interesting one. I mean, uh, I can only really offer you a personal perspective on that. I kind of, uh, I, I think in a way there are expectations um, on how he will perform because he's been uh, such a large um, 
such a large part of other other narratives of other stories. Um, so I, I, but I think that's that's down to the um, the players playing the game whether we either meet, surpass, or surprise those expectations um, in our game. I will keep Will alive. I promise you. <laughs> when the time comes. <laughs> good luck. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, one thought that I, I've had for a while is in, I, I can't speak to Little Hope, but at least in Man of Medan and in Little Nightmares, there are ways to imagine that the ending is hopeful or that you can get a happy ending or that you can win the game. Uh, Michelle, can you start us a little bit on whether or not you think it is important that a horror game be beatable? Hmm. You mean like you you finish the game and get a good ending? Is it, do you need to have the possibility of a good ending? Hmm. Either open to interpretation or because there are multiple endings like in the Dark Pictures anthology. I don't think it's, it's uh, necessary, I think. Probably the same question as, as in a movie. But yeah, if you can, at the same time, yeah, if it's a game and you can only lose and it's really noticeable to you that, okay, I get the bad ending and you can't get a good one. I don't know. It's, it might, might leave something to be desired, but I don't think you can rule it out in general. Really, it might be, it might be possible in certain cases or very specific scenarios, I think. I don't know. It's we, we would have to see it to see if it works. Lucas, what do you think? Well, I think we just should let the creators decide what kind of ending they want to do. Um, I <laughs> mean, like Little Nightmares One, the ending is, is I don't think like it's not happy, it's not it's not sad. Um, the DLC ending is very melancholic, um, and uh, and Ellen too. Well, you will see, of course. Uh, but there, I don't think there is any recipe for uh, making a just like uh, you know. Uh, the best ending possible. Uh, you know, I, I personally enjoy uh, endings that are not so happy because I think they, they are more memorable than the happy ones, but that's just like, you know, a mere opinion. Barney, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, what's a happy ending in a horror, right? Um, is it, um, <laughs> you know, coming out with uh, physically roughly intact or, um, you know, there's, I think, um, I think a kind of positive or a positive ending for a horror can be kind of finding a simple kind of resolution or some form of equilibrium again after you know such a crazy night journey dust or dawn kind of experience um I, th I think you know for us i think it's kind of important to to have the range of endings um uh and yes everybody can die and everybody can survive uh, including any other actors that might have been employed by us um <laughs> it's um so so yeah i think i think for us i think it's important to have that range uh, I, whether it feels successful or failure, that's kind of, um, that's, I think with, with regards to the replayability, I think if people are going to investigate sides of their personality and make different choices, you know, maybe have a, let their evil streak kind of win over, um, uh, maybe everybody dying would be a successful end to, to that playthrough. Um, I, I, yeah, that's, again, that's down to the player, I think. In the history of Hollywood horror, we often hear about the trope of haunted sets. So something weird happens on the set of The Exorcist, something terrifying happens on the set of The Shining. Have you ever had a scary experience developing a horror game? Uh, Lucas, you want to start us? Do you have any thoughts? Um, well, I, I hope not because I need everyone to, to be there to finish the project. So I hope every, <laughs> everyone is safe, uh, you know, in the team. Uh, but I mean, yeah, there's uh, of course like, you know, stories and then like, you know, uh, you've got like uh, the studio gathering for parties and stuff like that. But, uh, but no, hopefully not, 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 nothing too serious. Michelle? I know you just... create your games by yourself. So I imagine yeah, the, the solitude has got to be a little stressful sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just making the game is, is kind of scary. Um, yeah, because it's, it's, you get you get sometimes you get anxious how will it do will i make another game and and all these questions like um and if you invest this much time you get really really attached to the project in an almost unhealthy way i guess so that's scary and also one time i played the game in a chapel 
which the the game has a chapel which is based which is a real chapel so really is, i don't know it's from the 1500s or so which uh, i was I was playing there playing there as a child it was always fascinating <laughs> and so the chapel is also in the game so i thought i'll play play the chapel i'll go into the chapel in the game but take my notebook to the ch chapel and play there and I mean, it wasn't haunted, but it, it didn't really feel great because it's, it's still, I'm not a practicing Catholic, but my upbringing, it, it still, still kind, of, kind of felt wrong because, uh, because the church is this kind of a sacred place. So that was a bit of a bless, moment of blasphemy, maybe. Barney, any scary stories to share? <laughs> no, not, not massively. I mean, I, I think sort of speak for everyone here I'm sure like we get, we get gradually more and more desensitized um to horror it, it's not it's not cynicism but you're gradually desensitized but the um no I mean we, we become kind of acutely aware whether a kind of bug count or a, an email inbox unread emails might read 666 um <laughs> or uh, maybe you're working late one night and um the life-size uh, statue of the psycho from until dawn out the corner of your eye might just catch you unawares you know um, in the corner of the office. Um, so uh, we, have, we have our moments, but, um, but overall fairly calm. To that end, when you play horror games, be it your own or someone else's, what is a moment that stands out to you, something that really scared you in a horror game, a scene that really got you? Uh, Lucas, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, when, when it comes to, uh, to Little Nightmares 2, we've, we've got like uh, one chapter, which is really horror oriented and it's uh i mean you know i i think horror fans will we really love it and 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 it's it's still like freaking me when i'm playing it and i and i know what's going to happen and 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 i really enjoy having people at the office playing it and they're like really scared to shift it's it, it's 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 really really fun so yeah i can i can even sometimes be scared myself by by, by our own game which is I think a very good sign that, you know, this is going to be memorable for people who will play for the first time. How about you, Barney? Um, in terms of our own games, there's often, uh, there's often scares that they might get you the first, second time. Uh, and that, that's, that's kind of, that's quite normal. But if there's a scare that gets you the third, fourth, fifth and sixth time, you're still playing them. You're like, okay, we've we really nailed that one. That one's working, you know? Um, I think uh, I have to call out, um, a VR title we did, Russia Blood. Um, there were a number of moments in there. Oversized, screeching pig heads. Uh, that was a classic. Uh, that kind of got me on edge every time. It was the intensity. And also there was another part of the roller coaster ride. You go this long dip. And as you came back up the other side, there was this, uh, there was an oversized child's doll who just had this, just this gentle high-pitched giggle. And I think um, uh, this is, um, it was just the juxtaposition, I think, of that, that, the classic kind of horror moment, but that always sent a little shiver down my spine. I think it was after having kids that got me more. Sounds overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, it can happen. So, um, sometimes the enemies, if you're going into a house and do something and then you turn around and one of them is there, it can happen. Or one of them is passing in front of the window casually. But yeah, it's, it's mostly, I think some of the best moments are really like the ones that work after many times and not even ne necessarily jump scares or anything, but just moments or dark moments that are really hit, kind of hitting you in the gut just because of the atmosphere, because of the sound design or the music, just everything comes together nicely and you can, and every time you play it, it's, it's just really nice. You, you just, just to exp um, experience this moment again. And that's, that's a great feeling then. All of you have such original stories that you're telling, but a huge part of the horror genre is sequels and remakes and reboots and revisiting classic horror concepts. If there was one existing horror property that you could play with in the game space, what would it be and why? Anybody can feel free to start. I don't know. It could be. Uh, I mean, I don't have like one specific in mind, but I would. Uh, I'd probably love to play like uh, you know, uh, a David Lynch um, movie as 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 a point and click game or something like that. I think uh, that could be that could be really awesome. Um, like something very disturbing, 
something very weird. Um, yeah, that's, it's maybe because that's that's kind of you know the kind of weird stuff that we do. I mean, of course, it's different, but we we tend to to do just like stuff that are kind of unexpected. And I think his movies are doing that you know in an amazing way. So yeah, I'll probably pick up yeah some something from from Lynch. Michelle. Yeah, like a game of eraser hand. Yeah, for, <laughs> for example. I just, yeah, I just, I just thought Nosferatu would actually be amazing. Like, do it in black and white, and maybe even silent almost, and just make a really solemn, lonely game where you're the count. It could be really interesting. There could be sailing. <laughs> I don't know. It's. I'd I mean, the, it. the mood of that movie is just. It's, I mean the whole the whole mood mood of um, silent movies. Um, I don't know if it's been done in games or if it's too gimmicky, but I think just the, the whole aesthetic of it could lend itself really well to to a horror game. But then do something really original with it, and don't don't follow the template of the film too closely, but just taking it as a springboard for something original maybe. Barney. Um, I'd probably go the other way and want to take something um, otherwise fairly cute and innocent and, uh, and twist it. I don't know, something like um, uh, a little big planet or, um, <laughs> or something, something, something that my kids play just to make a little twist on that, I think. Well, that sounds pretty spectacular. With the time that we have left, I would love to hear a little bit more about each of your games coming up. Um, Barney, you're first because it's this Halloween. We're going to be getting Little Hope October 30th. Tell us what you can. Tease us as best you can. We're all very excited. Um, it's been uh, it's, it's been great to put the. To, it's, it's, we, we're literally kind of finishing, um, you know, as we speak um, uh, with regards to schedule, etc. Uh, it's been. I, I've got to be really careful about spoilers. We're so close to it now, <laughs> um, and I know. Uh, I think we've got our marketing PR guys on this call as well. Um, so, no, I mean, it's been great putting it together. As ever, it's a uh, super high quality um, uh, branching narrative game with uh, multiple twists, multiple layers. Um, uh, pacing's great. Um, we're all playing it through at the moment. We're, we're looking for polish areas. We're not finding that many. We're feeling good about it. Um, yeah, it's in it's in a really good place, and um, looking forward to this one coming out. Looking forward to the feedback. Um, you know, yeah, we're, we're feeling really good about this one. It's, I, I can't really say too much. I know I'll drop myself in it. My apologies. No, totally, totally fair. Okay. <laughs> um, we don't have to wait that long, which is great. Um, for you. Little Nightmares Two, correct me if I'm wrong, Lucas, but I think we're looking at February 11th of 2021. Yeah. That is um, correct. How are you feeling? What can you tell us? Well, I mean, we're still working very hard on the game, obviously, but um, I mean, Little Nightmares 2 is really expanding um, the world of Little Nightmares uh, and, and, and the recipe. We have um, six, the, the character from the first game coming back as an AI companion. So uh, it's going to be a very emotional journey with our new hero. Uh, you know, that the name is, is Mono. He's, he's got a little guy with the paper bag. Uh, and, and of course, it's going to be, um, we, we're going to keep it the same strength, the atmosphere, the, the cuteness versus the horror. Uh, we, we are adding new features, such as the ability to, um, to, uh, to, to wield uh, a weapon and, and, and fight so, like middle, I would say middle-sized enemies that you will meet in the game. But you will still have these amazing monsters uh, that make Little Nightmares very, very unique. And you will have to you know, find the best way, of course, to outsmart them. Um, we were having outdoor places. The game is, is much bigger than, than Little Nightmares 1, which was, which was um, you know, a bit short. So uh, overall, we are all very excited about, about the game. Uh, we think it's, a, it's, it's amazing. Of course, we still have, uh, you know, some work to do. Uh, but yeah, no, we think we're in a good place. Um, so the game will release uh, February 11th on, on PlayStation 4, uh, Xbox One, PC Digital, and Switch. And we have also announced a PS5 and, uh, and a Xbox Series X uh, uh, version for later in, in 2021. Michelle, I know Mondan has been an incredible labor of love for you that you've been doing over years and years and years. How are you feeling? I know you're looking at a spring 2021 release. Yeah. I don't know, it feels really unreal after 
all this time. It's really, really excited about it's really coming together now. It's like a really special kind of phase or moment when all the music comes in, the voice acting will come in soon. It's, it's, it's spoken in Romanche, which is, which is a very obscure language, which is only spoken in the Alpine region of Switzerland. And I mean, I, I hand drew every texture of the game and it's just, it's been a, a journey, which is I, when I started, uh, I didn't really foresee the scope of it, I think. And now that it really comes together in a, in a great way, it's, it feels amazing and also pretty emotional. And um, I can't wait to see how people will, how will, will react to the finished thing and finally show it to, to people. Yeah. Well, I am personally looking forward more than you could know to being terrified by all of the stories that you were telling. I cannot wait to dive into each. Thank you, Lucas, Barney, Michelle, all for joining us. Uh, this has been an incredible chat. Um, I hope everyone who's watching has a great uh, rest of their PAX East online uh, and has a great time uh, preparing for this year's Halloween, uh, for Little Hope coming out, for Little Nightmares 2 coming out, and for Mundan coming out. Thank you guys for joining us.